Okay, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to the 18th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones, and as meeting papers are provided in a digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. Uh, we have a full house of MSPs today, no apologies have been received, uh, pleased to see that. And we move to agenda item one, Local Government and Scotland Challenges and Performances 2018. The committee will take evidence from the Council's Commission on its report uh, local Government and Scotland Challenges and Performances 2018. And can I welcome Graham Sharp, Chair Accounts Commission. Welcome, Graham. Good to, to have you with us. I think for the first time. So great to see you. Uh, Fraser McKinley, Controller of Audit Accounts Commission. Ronnie Nicholl, Assistant Director of Performance Audit and Best Value. And Ashley Majority, Auditor, Performance Audit and Best Value Audit Scotland. Of course, Lovely to see you all, even if we've seen you before. Thank you, everyone, for coming along. And uh, I believe that uh, Mr Sharp may have an opening statement to make. Yes, thank you, Camilla. Right. The Accounts Commission welcomes the opportunity to discuss our Local Government in Scotland Challenges and Performance 2018 report with the committee. Uh, the report represents the Commission's annual commentary on key issues in the local government sector. The environment within which local government operates is increasingly complex with increasing levels of uncertainty. The UK's withdrawal from the European Union is expected to have profound implications for councils. The Scottish Government's commitment to a significant pace of public sector reform means that there are some major changes for local government at key stages of implementation. These events are taking place at the same time as substantial reductions in public spending and increased demand on many local public services. Implementing transformational change is becoming essential to councils as they respond to these challenges. Forecast funding gaps are higher than current levels of reserves for some councils, meaning that the delivery of savings is becoming increasingly crucial. The proper scoping, resourcing and management of transformational work is key if councils are successfully to deliver sustainable service change. Cohesive, decisive leadership is also needed to bring officers, councillors and their communities together to address the major challenges that councils face. Councils are engaging with the increasingly difficult task of managing the competing priorities of reducing costs and maintaining services for an ageing population. Current arrangements mean that some councils can expect to receive less government funding as their total population declines, while an increase in their older population means that demands on key services, such as social care, increase. At the same time, the implementation of significant policy and legislative changes will increase expectations and duties of councils, and in many cases will have additional resource implications. The detail of some of these changes is yet to be finalised. Despite continued budget reductions, national indicators suggest that councils have maintained or improved performance in a number of areas. However, customer satisfaction levels have fallen and some services are not keeping up with demand, suggesting that budget cuts are having an impact on services. Smaller service areas have so far borne the brunt of funding reductions. The recommendations in our report are directed at both senior managers and councillors, whose role continues to become more complex and demanding. We highlight again councillors' need for training and development and good information about finances and services, including long-term financial plans. There is substantial change in the environment within which councils operate, the Commission continually considers how its work reflects that changing environment. And this annual overview report is intended to be a helpful summary of evidence from the wide range of local government audit work carried out. It cannot realistically cover everything and is not a comprehensive review. However, it highlights the key challenges councils face and looks at some of the main ways councils are responding to increasing demand and reduced financing. So, convener, my colleagues and I are happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Sharp. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I might start on, on some of the numbers in relation to the finances available to, to local authorities, but that said, I think I should point out, I want to get 
eventually beyond the numbers, look to see local authorities are dealing with the challenges, irrespective of the figures. But just to get a better understanding of those figures, there, there's no doubt in the challenges facing local authorities. So at section 17 of, of your report, you, you say between 2010, 11 and 2018, 19, revenue funding has fallen by 9.6% in real terms. There's no denying that. Of course, this committee has, has sought to probe those numbers further during budget scrutiny. So, and I, saw that I don't have a direct crossover for those numbers. Um, but if you look at um, the years 2013, 14 through to 2018, 19, there'd be 355 million pounds of integrated joint board monies for health mm -hmm. and social care provision, which effectively goes to the kind of social work care side of things, mm -hmm. core business of local authorities that wouldn't be accounted in those stats, and another 150 million pounds of other grant money. So I had 505 million pounds in total not included within those figures, if I've got my sums right, and I may not have Mr Sharp, I'm happy to accept that I'm wrong here, but it's been put to me that that would be a 2.1% real terms cut. Still a cut, still significant, and still challenging. But what I want to get beneath is, I've asked these questions before to the Accounts Commission, is when we look at that 9.6% real terms cut, are we looking at the bigger picture? Or are we not looking at the bigger picture? Because if there's £505 million for the years I gave that goes to fund local government services through integrated joint boards, surely that has to be taken into account? Um, well, I mean, you've, you've, you've correctly identified a, an area of difference between um, the, the way d data is presented by different bodies. Um, and from our point of view, um, we've looked carefully at the rationale for the different amounts of money and and we are content that that this is the fairest way to, to present it that the position of the funding of joint boards is is not necessarily treated the same way um, across the board but um, I'm happy to to open that out and Fraser you might want to further expand on um, that. yeah not much not much to add conveners you know the the report that we presented to you previously uh, this is obviously the report we have in front of us today is uh, focuses on the wider uh, performance of councils, the one the Commission publishes in November is the one specifically about finances, and you're absolutely right, you've you've asked us this question, and, and in that previous report, we did try to better split out the different bits of, of local government funding, as you say. I think we, we continue to be of the view that because that integration money is actually funneled through the health budget, um, that that's reasonable for, for us to take to take the local government revenue settlement from government to local government as uh, as what's in the local government bit of the budget, if you like, and that's what this is referring to. Mm -hmm. We also recognise that there are other bits of funding for specific purposes. So so it, mm -hmm. um, we, we continue to, and, and obviously SPICE did a very helpful briefing just recently about local government finance, and my team was, was involved in, in working with the SPICE team on that. And as we look ahead to the next financial overview, which will be November of this year, we will continue to try and present all this in a way that's easier for everyone to, to get their heads around. Uh, that is very helpful, and I would, I would agree with all of that. Uh, I, I merely make the point, I want to explain this a little bit further, go beyond the numbers to actually see how the monies are being used, but um, I would merely make the point that £355 million over a six-year period going directly to support social care initiatives in local authorities has to be relevant when you're talking about uh, the spending power of local authorities and a revenue grant. And my feeling is it should sit beside it to give the bigger picture, but I don't see that within within the report. Uh, so that is actual money that's spent on the ground supporting services. And the Accounts Commission talks about changing demographics and ageing population. The, 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 you know, the, 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 the perfect storm, if you like, of a decreasing population, but an ageing population at the same time. So a smaller base, perhaps triggering less monies from central government, but a, a population with complex health needs, multi-morbidities, needing greater social care and support. Mm -hmm. So that's actually why I think it's pretty relevant to talk about the integrated joint board monies in relation to how some of this is supported. So we've done a mapping exercise between the monies from integrated joint boards to meet those demands that you directly mention in your report. So you say in your report that actually a big challenge we have is a declining population, but an ageing population, that might affect the revenue grant. But the other side of the coin 
might actually affect the integrated joint board monies that are available to meet that demand. So have you, have you matched those two together? So we're comp comparing apples with apples? Um, we haven't matched it together at a, an individual council basis, but I, I think there are two points there. Uh, what, one is about how you treat the monies as, uh, that you've correctly identified at the beginning. And a part of our rationale in, in determining how we look at it is looking at decision makers and, and who's responsible for the money. And obviously, if the money's going into the integrated joint board, it's the integrated joint board's responsibility. The councils work in partnership with the, the IJBs and indeed with other partners to provide many services. And here we're focusing on, on councils. And I think you can always expand um, the scope further to bring in more partners if you're looking at specific areas. But, but at the end of the day, you, you also want to have a view on, on, on councils. In terms of um, looking at it and, and breaking it down into to specific council areas, this is an overview report, so we're not um, considering individual councils, and we would do that in our individual best value assurance reports on the individual councils. So the, the point we're making here is that about 25% of councils are in a position where under current funding arrangements, their funding would go down as their overall population goes down. That's just the way the, 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 the formula works. But actually, um, in, in terms of the mix of their population and, and the potential needs of, of that population, it, it, you, you would anticipate that that, that, might, that might well increase as, in particular, um, older, the older population increases. So it's that um, disconnect between the direction of overall funding and demand. So resources go down as demand goes up. And it's, it's, it's a general point, and, and you're quite right, in, in terms of looking at an individual council, a best value report, we would look at all those issues and we'd look at the IJB as well. Okay, so uh, that, that, that is helpful. I suppose I, I just want to clarify uh, one thing and then to other members if we want to explore this theme further or, or move to a, a new theme. So I'm looking for members to catch my eye at this point. Um, and, and that's in relation to um, whether or not if revenue funds from local authorities uh, start to suffer because of a decline in co population vis-a-vis -vis to other local authorities, um, but they're getting an increasingly ageing population with more complex needs needing greater support, if that's not going to be fully reflected in the revenue grant, first of all, should it be? Do we have to look again at how the revenue grant waits for that kind of thing? Or alternatively, and this is why I started off my line of questioning, is this a way to better identify the monies that go to integrated joint boards? Is that a better area to put the money in to support that? Because we absolutely have to look at both at the same time to get an accurate picture of the financial support at a local level to support some of the older, more vulnerable people in society. So do we adjust the revenue grant formula to better weight that? Or do we assure ourselves that the integrated joint board uh, grants um, take account of that? What do you think it should be, Mr Sharp? Maybe neither, maybe a, a third solution. Um, I, I, I think I'm sort of, we'd be straying into sort of policy decision to give, give a, a view on that. I think what we can identify is that under the current structure, you do have this um, distortion for certain councils where funding's going in one direction and demand's going in another. Now, clearly there are different ways of trying to manage that. Uh, one may, way might be through IGBs, and then you'd need to look at how they are funded, how that links up with meeting the, the demands of that particular po population and whether it all fits together. And, a, and another way would be to just look at the, the funding formula itself and say, what, what are the ways, other ways we might structure the funding formula? Um, and I think that's a matter, you know, essentially for policymakers. Yeah. If, if I can briefly add, can be... I think in the, in the last report, the financial overview, back in November, the Commission did suggest that government and COSLA assure themselves that the funding formula is fit for purpose. Um, that's usual kind of auditor speak for, you might want to have a look at that, um, because for exactly this kind of reason, we think, I think I said last time we were here in very simple terms, the more um, we continue to add specific bits of funding for specific things, it does make you wonder whether the core funding formula still makes sense. It's been It's been pretty much as is for a long time. And my second point, very briefly, in, in Exhibit 4 of this report, the, the challenges 
uh, and, and performance report. It, it's important to bear in mind that the picture is very different across the country. Um, so, so I don't think one size is going to fit all. I don't think there is an, a, a straightforward answer to that question, and particularly in terms of funding for IGBs, because of course, uh, different IGBs across the land do very different things. The scope of services that are delivered through integration in lots of places. Uh, in some places, it's just adult social care. In some places, it includes children. So, so it's not straightforward. And, and in Midlothian, for example, which is on the right-hand side of that graph at Exhibit 4, they're experiencing completely different challenges to do with population growth uh, and quite significant increases in uh, the uh, population age zero to five young, young children. So, so the, the challenges in Midlothian are clearly very different to the challenges in Inverclyde. Um, and, and I think whatever funding formulas or way of funding those are, are, are designed, it needs to take cognizance of those individuals, local circumstances, I think. Okay, that, that's very helpful. Um, some, some supplementaries. Um, uh, from, from members just now. Before I move on, I should point out, I, I almost apologise to witnesses for yet again raising this theme at committee, but I still feel we've not quite got, got a hold of, of, of this matter, which is why I, I keep raising it. I find it really difficult to get an overall picture of what's actually happening, but I would also put on record, irrespective of that overall picture, I don't think any of us would, would, would seek to diminish the significant challenges in local government finances um, I also know uh, that chief executives and council treasurers will hate me for saying this, but money is inputs, and much of this report is about how you deliver outcomes and you manage and show leadership and workforce plan, and I'm sure we'll come on to, to all of that. So there's, there's my slight apology for that line of questioning, but no doubt it'll be the same time next year, and I'll ask it all over again. Uh, Jenny Gilruth. Convener, um, just as a, a follow-up question then to your, your line of questioning there, Convener, um, with regard to workforce planning and specifically with regard to IGBs, um, I have a local issue in my constituency and actually it's fife wide at the moment with regard to the closure of out-of-hours services and the uh, responsibility, I suppose, or the, the reasoning is being provided uh, to MSPs is that it's due to uh, GP numbers. Now, I really would like to get a bit more clarity with regard to who you think is responsible for the uh, workforce planning in terms of GP numbers because obviously we have the health and social partnership we have the IGB on which elected members sit you have the council you have the Scottish government it's pretty difficult uh, as a constituency MSP sometimes to get that accountability at local level and last week the IGB voted um, on the closure of out of our services and on a public consultation which is now going to happen elected members were, were taking part in that vote um, and I also note from your report that one of the uh, strategic priorities relates to councillors having the right knowledge and skills to scrutinise uh, council performance and decision making so I suppose there's a question mark there over do our elected members have that you know knowledge and skill based to make those decisions but also who do you view as having responsibility for uh, GP numbers and, and workforce planning it's quite a niche question I appreciate um, do, you, do you want to take that to yeah. that? so um, this this isn't me ducking the question but we are doing a report in November about um, uh, integration and right. progress so mm -hmm. so these are exactly the kinds of issues that yep. that's a joint report with the Council Commission and the Order General because it recognises that integrating health and social care is a joint uh, responsibility yeah. uh, across national and local government. Um, so, so having, and, and I should also say that as well as that, the Auditor General is planning next year to do a report specifically on primary health care workforce. We did an acute one last year, uh, and we're, we're now going to be looking at primary care, which is, which is where we'll pick up the GP number. So having said all of that, um, in, in strict terms, workforce planning for GPs is the responsibility of the NHS. But clearly, you have to look at that in the context of the services that you're trying to deliver locally. Yeah. And that's where, as I mentioned earlier, the scope of the powers, uh, and forgive me, uh, Ms. Guru, I, I can't remember what the scope of the IGB is in Fife off the top of my head, but, but clearly the, the scope of the services that are within the uh, powers of the IGB in Fife will, there, will therefore determine how, how they're deciding how to uh, shape services locally. Mm -hmm. Your point about um, the role of uh, elected members is well made. I would argue that exactly the same uh, case is made for the NHS board members that sit on the mm -hmm. IGB, other way round, yep. um, because they have to get their, their heads around social care in a way mm -hmm. um, uh, that, that they haven't been used to. And these are all absolutely the kind of questions that we are looking at and we'll be reporting on uh, later in the year because we, we see very um, patchy, I think, experience of how this is working of how this is working locally so I'm afraid I can't give you an answer to the specifics of the Fife case but more broadly absolutely recognize some of those challenges thank you
Graham Simpson. Thanks, convener. Um, I, I was just looking at uh, Exhibit 4, which you, you, you mentioned earlier. I think that's a, it's quite fascinating, actually, to look at the areas where populations are decreasing and increasing and the, the different age groups. Uh, and I, I, I'm just wondering whether you think that the, the, the current funding formula, the way that councils are given money, should change on, on the basis of you know, age of population and, and, and whether, whether those various groups are going up or down? Well, well I, I think that's um, the, the, the point Fraser was uh, referring to earlier. We, we have suggested that, that this is looked at. It's, it's not for us to decide um, on what the formula should be, but um, clearly the existing formula is having different effects on different councils because different councils are 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 finding um, a different pattern of movement in resources and demand, yeah. and and the, the 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 formula isn't matching movement in resources to movement in demand in that sense. Uh, so I, that's why we think it's worth um, that being looked at. So where where would we look as a committee to, you know, establish the the, the gaps? Well, the, the formula is agreed be, between COSL and the Scottish Government, so it, it would be for them to consider the matter and, and have a look at alternatives to see if there was a better way of doing it. But certainly, we are pointing out that at the moment there is clearly a, a disparity in individual councils. Bec I, and in, in fact, this is a, a general point. This is an overview report to give um, a, a view of... of sort of local government across the board. But an important fact to bear in mind throughout this is that there is considerable variation across individual councils. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the areas where, where that comes through quite strongly in terms of, of funding and, and demand. And so, and that is one that we've highlighted before. It's always a controversial area, of course, because when you start mm. meddling with the funding formula, councils fall out with each other. And Absolutely. You know, yeah. pe people leave Cosler and things like that. Mm. And come back. I don't ask. I don't ask you to comment on that. Uh, That's just uh, the reality. It would be great if you did comment <laughs> on it, but I think there might be mission drift. Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I think we've got that frustration as well, which is why I was wondering whether, if we don't tinker with the the revenue support grant formula for local authorities, do we tinker with the IGB inputs? And so mm. we have to put our head around that as a committee to make sure it better reflects the need in the communities that, that we serve. Absolutely. It's a really important line of questioning. Uh, Monica Lennon, MSP. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, when the report came out in April, the section that I was most concerned about was really about the experience of, of older people um, who need adult social care. And it was a sort of section at page 36 where, um, you know, for example, you, you see that Recent local inspections have raised significant concerns about social care service ability to meet demands from older people. And there's some examples from different parts of the country. For example, people in Edinburgh waiting 100 days for an assessment and people then having to wait a further time for a care package um, to be put in place. Um, Scottish Borders, nine week waits for top priority cases. And we were told that overnight care for people at the end of their life who wanted to, to die at home was especially problematic. So there seems to be a problem, you know, right across the country. Um, I know you've posed a question in the report. Um, how are your council and IGB managing demand for social care services? And I appreciate a lot of the IGBs are just uh, bedding in, and we've talked about this a lot in a in a, another committee that I used to sit on at public audit, but. You know, is there enough national guidance um, coming down from the Scottish government to allow people to sort of meet local demand but have a sort of consistency of of service? And, and how do IGBs and councils share best practice? Because we've talked a lot about the challenges, but there must be some really good work happening as well. How do we try and um, cascade that learning? Well, uh, I think first, um, as, as you've recognised, um, IGBs have sort of taken over responsibility quite recently, so it's still early in, the, in, the, in their life. And um, as Fraser mentioned, there are um, different models across the 32 councils, so it's not a, a single um, uh, division of responsibilities. Um, 
and also, as, as Fraser's mentioned, we are doing a report on this later in the year and looking at IGBs uh, precisely for this, this reason. They're new, they've got a very important role to play. Um, how the IGB um, works with the council is hugely important, as indeed how, how it works with the, the, the local national health provision is also very important. So, so that's, that is an area of, of um, concern for us to, to understand and, and look at, but it's one that we'll be looking at later in the year. Yeah. I think just to add, without giving too much away, I think um, that there's no doubt that IGBs and, and when the Commission and the Auditor General reported at the last time round, a um, huge amount of focus on getting themselves up and running. So governance, some of the relationship issues on, on the boards, budgets has been uh, extremely tricky and continues to be, we think, um, just how exactly the monies from the health side uh, and the council side are working, um, both in terms of coming together to form a budget, but then even more uh, problematically sometimes when there's an overspend and what happens to that. Um, so, so lots of issues there. Now, that's not to say that there isn't good stuff happening on the ground, because there is. Uh, we, I think most people would recognise that there's lots of great practice. I think the question for us is whether that's happening because of integration or whether it's happening anyway, or in some cases whether it's happening in spite of integration. So that's the kind of stuff that we're really looking to get under the skin of in this next piece of work, which is, I think we're visiting six different areas, really to try and get under the skin of what's actually happening in terms of service delivery. Having recognised that a lot of the focus was about governance and about getting set up, we're now asking the question, so what difference is this beginning to make to the way services are delivered and therefore outcomes for uh, people and, and their families on the ground? So that's that's exactly where we're at. Uh, what we see from the care inspector at work, as you've identified, is that there continue to be some, even where there is some good practice locally, some quite uh, thorny systemic issues that need to be um, addressed. And that's, that's exactly where you would expect the IGB to be making the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I appreciate it's still quite early days for IGBs and that focus on governance is really important. But when you look at the experience that people are having, um, it, it does have cause for concern. Um, we know that, that workforce is clearly a big issue. I also note in your report that a survey of home carers, uh, home care workers by Unison in 2016 found that 80% felt that their service had been affected by budget reductions and many staff described this as a focus on quantity, not quality. When you hear things like that, it's hard to see that, that people are going to be um, you know, attracted to working in, in social care. Is, is, that, is that a problem to, to recruitment more generally? Well, I, I think the workforce planning issue is, is an issue that we've identified more generally. Um, and it, it, it has a number of, of aspects to it. And I mean, one of them, is, as you'll have seen in, in the report and in other reports, is um, it's healthcare is one of the, the areas that, that um, is, is a major employer of uh, European uh, workers. And, and that would be uh, a factor that will affect things going forward, depending what happens on, on a Brexit arrangement. So undoubtedly, um, Workforce is an issue, but um, as, as Fraser said, it, the, the whole structure around IGBs and how they're operating and how they're integrating with their sort of constituent bodies, as it were, is, is something that, that we need to, to look at. And um, it, it is early days, but it's really very important. And um, we're looking at, at bodies that, 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 that effectively are a partnership between two quite different sorts of organisation with different cultures and different budget structures. And all that needs to, in some way, um, fit together to support uh, a satisfactory service. On workforce, we know that reducing staff numbers has been one of the, the main ways that councils um, have reduced their spending. And we know that this will likely continue in, in councils. Um, are councils adequately staffed or resourced, well, staffed and resourced to manage and achieve transformational change? And I'm wondering about not just the numbers of staff, but also the skills and do we have the right mix of people doing the right jobs? Well, um, certainly we've um, emphasised workforce planning and indeed an organisational wide workforce plan. Um, and I think we noted that that barely half of councils have an organisation-wide workforce plan. And the, and the reason we mention that specifically is, is because if you're looking at transformational change, um, 
well, what, what, well, first of all, what, what is transformational change? It, it starts with, with looking at the outcomes and saying, how do we best uh, achieve those outcomes, forgetting about how we do it now, it, what's the best way given what's available to us? And then um, the, the sorts of uh, techniques one would be thinking people would be looking at would be more flexible working within organisations, better use of digital technology, both to transform what's happening inside and also how you supply services, working in partnership um, with other councils or with, uh, with bodies that are outside that are not councils. All those things are part of transformational change. And, and the workforce parts are very important because you're looking at potentially a different shape of organisation with potentially different um, services being supplied. So what you need to do is, is to really look at your skill base going forward and what you'll need for that, that new shape and, and look at what you have now and then have a plan to get from one to the other. So um, it, 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 it may well be achievable with, with fewer numbers, but it may well be that the, 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 the skills that are needed are different and there needs to be a plan as to how you, you um, transfer those skills or acquire those skills into the workforce. So, so it is a very important issue that is an integral part of transformational change. I don't so know I if you want to add anything to that. Just, just briefly, I think that part of the challenge, and, and obviously as well as this overview report, um, I report to the Accounts Commission on individual best value audit reports. And, and one of the things uh, we look at there is the extent to which councils are investing in teams to help the transformational change, exactly as you say. And that, that's quite a difficult thing for councillors quite often because you could argue that they're not seen as frontline staff. Um, and actually trying to invest in a team that's going to help deliver the change that, that Graham's just described is quite difficult. Our, our sense is that you do need to invest in it though and you do need to resource it properly um, uh, uh, because that's the only way in which they're going to manage to make the kind of changes that we think they need to make. Fiza, I wonder if you've come across any examples in local authorities where they, they kind of know that approach is going to be beneficial but they're resisting it in the short term because of funding pressures or are there examples of leaders within uh, leadership teams within councils that maybe don't see the value in it? Um, yeah, I think I think we see a mix of a mix of those things. So we've definitely seen recently c councils that have invested in in those teams, and I think it's probably no surprise that the bigger councils find that a bit easier to do. Uh, I think some of the really small councils really do struggle to resource, um, if you like, at the corporate centre, a team that's going to help the transformational change. I think our argument, the Commission's argument, would be, in, if anything, those are the councils that most need to do it, um, because that's where it's most most uh, most required in some cases. So, so I think it's um, my sense is it's not a kind of resistance to change thing. It's a genuine trying to make the uh, the books balance, trying to invest and and protect the most vulnerable in communities. And in that context, it is quite difficult to be seen to be investing in in the corporate back office centre but but I think we are we are continuing to to encourage councils to do that and my sense is that people are beginning to are not beginning to are absolutely realizing that the status quo needs to needs to shift and I, I, I'd add to, to, to that that where we have looked specifically at councils that, that are small and and maybe challenged to, to carry out that the, the transformational change program we have very much encouraged them to look outside and seek assistance from other sources to supplement their their, their own in-house skill base because it is easier for um, larger councils to put together a team of people to to go around and and look at it and and transformational change itself even after you've designed it the implementation is hugely important and and difficult it's probably about 50 percent of of the difficulty in 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 doing it so so the importance of people who are able to actually carry that out um, is can't be underestimated and, and um, the smaller councils may need to acquire that from outside. Okay, just a, a final question from me on that point then. So going outside of the council, um, are you meaning sort of buying in consultancy services or is that other opportunities to work with perhaps other public bodies who are doing some of this work for planning already? Because I appreciate for smaller councils, it's maybe hard to set up a, a full team on that. So what could that look like? I, I, I think they can access various different sources. They, 
they can speak to their peers and other councils to, to get advice. They, they can get support from, from COSLA, they can get support from the improvement service. They, they, they can go outside to, to specialists in particular areas. If it's, if it's something around procurement, they can go to procurement specialists. So I think it's identifying the, the different skills they need and, and looking at where they can get assistance. Uh, for that particular area, um, but but I think they need to draw on all these things if if they don't have the resource in house because it's it's not really an option to to make it up. You you do need um, expertise to to do it properly. Thank you. Okay, so we we'll get some further lines of questioning. But Mr. Simpson, was it a supplementary you had in relation to this line of questioning? Because I was going to bring Mr. Stewart in next. Um, I think it probably is convener. Um, Yes, because um, he mentioned small councils uh, and their ability to change, and I was just looking at um, the figures on um, uh, sickness days, uh, noticing that Clack Manager, which I think is the smallest council, um, is consistently the highest for, for sickness days. Um, if you take non-teaching non staff, um, 16 and a half days a year, um, that is the highest. It compares to 8.8 .8 days in East Ayrshire. Um, if you close that gap, it, you know if it, it, it could be 730 full-time employees across Scotland. Uh, for teachers, um, again, East Ayrshire seems to be the best. 9. Point, uh, sorry, 4.1 days uh, compared to 9.8 days in Clack Manager. You know. If there's something East Ayrshire is doing that Clack Manager is not doing, um, and Clack Manager and others presumably could save an awful lot of money uh, if they did things differently. If you have you looked at this in any detail? Well, as as you'll be aware, we we did have a best value um, assurance report on Clack Manager a couple of months ago, um, and it, it, we did say that uh, the council had to take. Uh, urgent action to, to address the situation it, it, it was facing. It couldn't continue in the way it had been it had been operating for the, for the last few years. And um, as as we always do, we followed that up, up with a meeting and we continue to monitor the position through through um, our auditors. So I think the position in, in Clark Manager is is specific to Clark Manager and and the the I mean for example the the absence figures, uh, as I recall the report, one, one of the issues was in, in, um, in finding ways to, to save money. Um, it, it was not, noted that um, posts weren't always filled, so perhaps staff were running with fewer um, members than, than was normal, and that can sometimes lead to uh, effects such as greater levels of absence. So Clark Manager is, is, is an area where um, they do need to look at, at how they operate and, and carry out a change programme, and we've said that publicly. Mm. But in terms of I mean, East, East Ayrshire, presumably, re reading from your report, East Ayrshire seems to be the best uh, in terms of uh, managing absence. Um, so have you, I mean, have you looked at what they're doing that other councils aren't? Yeah. Thanks, Convener. Um, no, in this in this piece of work, we, we simply reflected the, the material that's come through. Although um, the Commission did publish a, a best value assurance report on East Ayrshire this week uh, as well. Uh, but inevitably, with any of these reports, we, we can't cover absolutely everything. We tend to focus on what we consider are either the key risk areas for a particular council or those activities where which we think are are particularly crucial to the current uh, context in which councils are operating. Um, and we haven't drilled down into sickness absence in any great detail at this stage. Thing. Okay. That's fine. Okay. On this specific point, Mr Gibson? Yes, it's on a specific point, because I think this is, a, this is the real crux of the matter. I think we all appreciate the local authorities are under serious financial pressure, but um, what we see, for example, from, from, your, 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 from some of your figures, for example, on Exhibit 9, is that there's been a 41% reduction in expenditure on collecting council tax, and yet the the collection has remained uh, uh, the same, about 96%. So efficiencies have been really effective in delivering the same kind of outcome. But we get widely disparate d d different differentials in terms of um, 
outcomes uh, by local authority and without having without being um, picking on Clack Manninshire, if you look at Exhibit 10, there was a 25.2% increase in the, in the cost of recycling compared to Aberdeenshire City Council uh, last year, which had a 33% reduction in, in terms of cost of recycling. And yet when you look at the percentage of, of uh, waste recycled in Aberdeenshire, um, it was more or less the same. There was an improvement in Clack Manninshire of 8.4%, but nothing like the increase in cost. And that might be I don't know, one-off costs, for example, to improve that um, recycling rate. But I think one of the concerns that, that I've raised before at this committee and other colleagues have raised um, over the years is the fact that uh, there seem to be uh, widely differing costs uh, in terms of delivering very similar services in fairly similar local authorities. And yet... Uh, um, and, and there doesn't seem to be this um, learning from each other, so to speak. Um, we talk about transformational change, but surely if, if uh, local authorities are going to deliver more with less, as they have done in council tax collection, there has to be more working together to, to, to learn and share best practice going forward. I, I think there um, are a, a couple of points in that. And first of all, in, in general, uh, as, as I think we've all been saying, there are variations across local authorities and and one of the issues about looking at national figures is they really pose a question rather than provide an answer and and you then need to go back and look at the individual circumstances to find out if if there are legitimate reasons for differences or not and those differences might be uh, to do with supply and demand the geography or even priorities of councils because councils it, can legitimately have different priorities depending on, on how they see the, the critical needs of, of, of the citizens in their area. Um, that said, um, clearly we uh, encourage um, best practice um, and we, well now that we've changed our best value regime and we're doing all the councils over a five year cycle rather than just looking at councils on a, on a risk assessed basis, clearly we're, we're going to be uh, reviewing more councils with more best practice and, and we are, as, a, as, as a body are going to have more opportunity to, to share good practice uh, among councils and um, it's something we generally encourage in any event and, and um, councils themselves through Cosl and Solis also um, seek to share uh, good practice through uh, in various different areas through partnership bodies and whatever. I mean, Fraser, you can fill think, that out. I think the only thing to add, convener, is that um, uh, Mr Gibson's point is extremely well made, and this committee has taken an interest over the years in the local government benchmarking framework, which is where that this data comes from. And as you know, the, the point of that thing is to do exactly as you've just described. And I think what the Commission have been urging councils to do is, as well as publishing the report and doing all that stuff, is actually getting under the skin of, well, how, how are you doing it? in that council, what can I learn from that and how can I, um, you know, never mind getting to the best, but even if everyone got to the current average, that would make an enormous difference. So that's the thing that we are continuing to bang the drum on. It's fair to say that not everyone likes it when we produce exhibits like this, because they'll say there's lots of stuff you don't understand and it's a blunt instrument and all that. And of course, that's, I, I understand that. Our point, though, is it does begin to ask some questions and it's the, the phrase they use, it's a bit of a can opener. Uh, and that's exactly how we would yeah. expect this kind of stuff to be used to, to encourage, whether it's on sickness absence, we've got another chart in here about educational attainment. Um, so uh, across the board, so, so, we're in, so the Commission is not suggesting that everything should be the same, because there can be lots of perfectly good reasons why either spend or performance is different in different places. What we do have an issue with is unexplained variation. If they just don't know, then, then we think that's not good enough. Um, and they should be able to explain um, why something is as it is in terms of a cost or a performance level. Uh, and, if, and if they're content with that, as Graham says, it might be a prioritisation question, then, then that's OK and they need to explain that to their local communities. But too often, I think, um, that it isn't explained and you just see the enormous variation in cost and performance. OK, thank you. Let's give it. Sure. Thank you. You've identified in the report, as we've heard already today, about the increased demand and the, the falling resources, and, and we all understand that. But you also talk about that councils are increasingly relying on reserves uh, to bridge some of that projected funding gap. 
and within the report, you, you talk about short-term and medium-term financial planning, and that seems to be managing reasonably well across the piece. Uh, most councils are managing to deal with short-term and medium-term planning. But when it comes to long-term planning, that seems to be where the biggest difficulty arises, uh, that some councils are managing that on a reasonable level, where others are failing to manage that effectively. And if they're not managing a, a long-term financial management structure and they don't have a strong workforce planning, then that is a recipe for disaster. Uh, and, and that's really where we find ourselves with some of these councils. So how can they continue to thrive and survive if they do not do both of these that you're asking them to do? Well, we've been um, uh, encouraging councils uh, to have medium, detailed medium-term plans and less detailed, but nevertheless sort of scenario-based long-term plans for, for some time. And, and um, I think, the, first of all, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. You, you need to have all of this in place, particularly when you're looking at transformational change, because we're no longer in a world where you can rely on doing it the way you used to do it yesterday and, and, and tweak that, and it's OK tomorrow, because tomorrow may look quite different from yesterday. And that's, that's a, point, a message we've been given, giving quite strongly for, for a few years now. Um, the position has certainly improved. It's not that many years ago, I think, and, and Fraser would be be better, um, have a better knowledge base on it than me in this, that you, 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 you would get um, heads of finance of some councils saying, well, um, how can we plan for more than one year when the government's only giving us one year of funding? And, I, I think our response to that uh, would be, well, th th that's really not the point. You're responsible for running the organisation. And um, the fact that, that, that funding is more uncertain makes it actually more important that you plan for the future and you look at different scenarios. So I, th I think generally uh, councils have, have improved since then and many more have uh, reasonable medium-term financial plans. They're doing things differently in different councils, and that's okay. If The point is that they think about it and they, they, they have a rational basis for what they're doing. Um, and we've seen already d different approaches to that. I, I'm not sure absolutely everyone's there yet. And and as they, they get up to medium-term, then they need to go on to long-term, particularly when you're linking it in with transformational change, because you need to know the shape of organisation you're looking to have, and that needs to fit in with how you see the future of of your citizens in your particular geography and demo, demographics and all the rest. So, so I, I completely uh, I agree with the basic point you're making, and and I think we are improving, and and further improvement is needed. I, I don't know if you want to, General. We talk a lot about the budget process, making sure that councils have uh, enough resources uh, and they put forward their, their case uh, and they ensure that there is funding uh, in, in their areas of responsibility. And within that, from time to time, we get overspends, sometimes on social care, sometimes on road maintenance. But we also get massive underspends that seem to be being used. And these underspends are then used to try and manage the situations they find themselves in. So if they're, if they're identifying massive underspends, then the budget process is not thorough enough uh, or is not being looked at strategically to ensure that they have enough funding to make sure that does take place. So I, I'd like a view on that. I think on, on the detail of the budgeting process, do you want yeah, to? I mean, so absolutely, and I think it's partly to do with the budget process and partly it's to do with financial management and financial reporting, I think. So one of the things we said in the November report, again, just to hark back to that briefly, was as well as an overall trend of more councils dipping into reserves. And, and again, one needs to be careful because, of course, using reserves can be an entirely legitimate thing to do. So the nature of how you're using the reserves is important. But our sense was that there were more uh, councils dipping into reserves to support the running of day-to-day -day services, which is, which, generally speaking, is not a good idea. But the other interesting thing that we reported on then was the enormous variation in the extent to which reserves were being used against what was planned, but in both directions. So some, so about half the councils were using more, about half the councils were, were using less than planned. So, which I think touches on your point about the importance of um, good budgeting in the first place, good monitoring of spend and good reporting of that through the year. Um, and doing that in the context of having a good medium to long term 
financial plan, which, as the chair says, has moved a long way, to be fair, over the last over the last five years in council. So, um, I think what I would also say about the budget process is, and and many of you as as ex councillors will probably recognise that the budget process now is a much more all year round process. There was a day where it started in Christmas time and it finished in February. Um, now, I was I was on one council website uh, just this week, um, where they've launched the consultation on the budget now for setting the budget in February. And I, I, I think, I think that is the way forward, because if, if you are trying to identify, and as you've already alluded to this morning, some councils have massive variations. Uh, some councils may spend 50% of their budget on education and social care. Uh, some may spend 60, but others, uh, and we've touched on Clackman, may spend 80% of their budget on education and social care. Now, that gives them nowhere to go uh, to, to try and manage that crisis and that situation. And, and you've identified that they need to come up with some kind of plan, but it, it's, it's virtually impossible uh, when you're only dealing with a 20% margin that's left uh, for them to, to, to make that possible without having to have drastic reduction in services even further than they've gone before. So it, 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 it's how we all manage that process to ensure that the funding is going in the right location and the councils have enough to keep themselves going uh, because they say if they don't, then there will be some crises and there may be some losses of councils if in the next three or four years if they sustain and continue going at that level. Yes, and I, I, th I think you make two points there. I mean, one is the importance of individual councils uh, planning properly, which which I think we've, we've discussed, and the other one is 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 the general trend on expenditure, and we we did illustrate that um, uh, making s some assumptions. I mean, essentially that nothing changes, and you you just roll forward and what happens, and and yes, if you do that, you see that the the two big um, sort of protected areas, if you like, uh, squeeze everything else. Uh, therefore, there's a multiplier effect on any funding reduction on those services. Um, and of course, for for many people, those are uh, the services they, they see. Not everyone uh, benefits from social care, not everyone benefits from education. So, um, uh, and you, you see, for example, um, satisfaction goes down in some areas. So. That's not perhaps entirely surprising because perhaps the, the reductions in services that, that people perceive in, uh, are greater for, for some people. Um, and and we, we put in that example to, to highlight this issue, that it is important. And many of, of these services might not, I don't want to use the front line because some of them might be regarded as front line, but, but they might not be so clearly related to, to immediate effects and, and clearly regulatory services would fall into that category. Yet when they, they fail, um, it can lead to very serious consequences, but one isn't aware of those consequences till something happens. So, I mean, there is an issue around that and about continuing to provide um, a, a proper standard of services across the board. And, you know, it, it's, it's challenging. We, we've in no shape or form do we say that, that, that this is a, 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 an easy job at the moment, but um, that, that is one of the challenges. The only, the only thing I would add very briefly, convener, is I'd, we, we set out in ex Exhibit 2 the pattern of spending and the extent to which education and social care is now presenting the, the, by far the biggest chunk um, of spend. What, what I wouldn't necessarily therefore accept is that that can't be affected by change and transformation. I think we would challenge the, the concept that because a council spends whatever 60-70%, um, 80% even of its spend on education and social care, that therefore that's a kind of given and we need to concentrate on the others. I think the arguments for change and transformation have yeah. to apply to education and social care as they do okay. everything else. Yeah. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Andy Whiteman. Uh, thanks very much and um, thanks for another uh, very interesting um, report. I just wanted to take you to, to exhibit one, the kind of context for all of this, the, the um, UK, Scottish legislative and policy changes are taking place. Um, I mean, obviously, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot in here. This committee's just in the midst of dealing with a planning bill as well, which will potentially pose some challenges as well. Um, can you give some sense of where we are in relation to the challenges facing local government uh, in a historical context? I mean, are we in unprecedented times? Um, or have we been here before, and what can we learn from past experience? 
That's an interesting question. Um, I, I, would, I would say from my perception, um, life is now more complex uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sort of proper sense, i.e. Uh, A affects B affects C affects A. Um, everything is more joined up, everything is, is faster and more complex than it's been before. Um, and with local government being in many ways that the sort of delivery end of many policies, um, the link between central and, and local government is is more uh, intermingled than than it perhaps has been in the past. Which, when you put together with the financial pressure, I think it is more complex. But um, I'm interested in other views, Ronnie. Yeah, go to the old guy who's been around a long time. Um, Certainly, I, I think that there. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would um, necessarily um, want to quote the word uh, unprecedented, but there are. The reason we've put this exhibit in is to try to illustrate that it is a bit different uh, at the moment because there are, uh, as, as the chair says, um, the pace of change, I think, is much more significant. The complexities involved are more complex, if you like. There's always been complex problems in local government, but I think that, uh, that they are. Uh, multifaceted in a way that, that I think is different. Technology, of course, as we know, um, speeds everything up. Uh, and apart from anything else, that often speeds demand. Social media creates an, a different environment from councils than it used to be. Uh, all those types of things. Um, and then there are some of these individual um, shifts that are potentially very significant in themselves, such as um, withdrawal from the European Union. And the, we've, we've, you know, across the board, we're looking at uh, issues around the new financial powers and how that changes um, public services in the country and creates a new agenda there as well, which is partly to do with local government as well. And so I think I'd certainly support the view that um, there are uh, very significant changes ahead. Our um, key message being that councils need to be prepared for that and organising themselves in that context and not expecting things to be the same and not considering that their job, as it might have used to be when I started in local government a long, long time ago now, that was basically about delivering the same service every year the same way and delivering the service in the same way to every person. And that's radically changed uh, over my working career. Um, but I think the pace of that and the significance of all that has become much, uh, much greater. And some of these, I mean, you, you, you phrase these as... Um um, implications and, and challenges, because some of these are opportunities the, uh, to, to do things different in a very positive way, which we couldn't in the past. You mentioned uh, uh, digital, of course. Uh, now, a minute ago, um, Mr. Sharp um, uh, reflected on the fact that one year budgets is not a reason to not um, scenario plan for the future, and I very much agree with that. Um, but given that Scottish local government has got virtually no fiscal autonomy at all, it's got amongst the least in the whole of Europe, um, surely that does have an impact in your capacity to be able to plan for the future because on the core question of resourcing, sure, you can do things differently, uh, you can plan for different scenarios, um, you can have uh, efficiencies, um, but the one thing you can't do in the present um, climate is say, well, how are we going to raise revenue in different ways. Now, some of this we'll touch on with the Alios report uh, later. But have you considered doing some work looking at um, the, the um, comparative work across UK um, and Europe about how other local states are adapting um, and, and, and transforming to meet some of the same challenges that we are facing, um, but they're doing it within a different political context? Um, I'll come back to that, that, that question in a moment. Um, first of all, um, I think if, if, if you're only given a one-year settlement, I think the point I'm making is that's not a reason for you not to um, only look one year ahead. In fact, you have to look much further ahead than that in order to keep your organisation going in a sensible way, given the challenges it faces. I'm not suggesting that um, it wouldn't be better if... if if you were given more than a one-year um, view of, of, of financing, um, just to be, be clear about that. Um, 
in, in terms of comparative work, when, when we carry out um, uh, national performance audits, we frequently do look um, uh, in, in other areas um, as to what's being done. I'm, I'm just trying to think if we've done it on this, and I'm not sure we have. Not, not specifically, and I suppose, um, but, but it does seem to me that it's, as you say, it's, it's widely recognised, I think, and things like COSLA's Commission for Strengthening Local Democracy, which was a couple of years ago now, I guess, that was published, went into quite a lot of a lot of that territory. And um, and certainly from our perspective as auditors, we we look to places like Australia, Australia and New Zealand um, for comparators as much as we do other places in, in Europe. And, and again, the both the structure and funding of local government in those countries is very different to what we have here. So, so there's no doubt that that is an important part of the context. I guess you'll also appreciate for us that that very quickly begins to stray into some quite tricky policy and political territory for us. So, so in a sense, we are kind of working with the framework that there is, recognising that not least recently in Edinburgh with the research paper that they, they, they published last week about the, I forget what its official title now is, um, Mr. Whiteman, you'll remember the tourist tax, the visitor levy. transient visitor levy, thank you, um, is obviously a very, very live debate uh, that we'll continue to watch with interest. Okay. Sorry? Was it the follow-up on some of that, Mr. Lake? Uh, no, I'm fine. I'm happy to, 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 to go into other areas, but others yeah. won't come in with a short time. Yeah, just I'm wondering if we could be asked a bit more on workforce, given that's going to form a key part of our, our budget scrutiny. And uh, Mr. Sharp, I think you'd mentioned uh, Brexit is, is one of the challenges. Lots of challenges, that, that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, do you have a sense that local authorities have done a full audit to work out, for example, how many EU nationals that, that they are employing? Are they in dialogue with them in relation to reassuring them? Um, have they factored in what the recruitment challenges are going forward in relation to that? Well, on, on, on Brexit, I mean, we know that local authorities are individually and collectively um, doing quite a bit on Brexit. And this year, um, we've, we've um, specifically asked auditors to, to look at what their councils are doing on Brexit. And um, um, that's really in three areas. One's financial, um, one, uh, another's regulatory, and the third one is, is workforce. And so we will get reports back across the board um, on this year's reports as to what's happening. Um, I mean, Fraser, do you want to...? That's the key bit of work, so we'll have a, a stronger evidence base. But I guess anecdotally, convener, I would say that I think councils are aware of it. I think there's been quite a lot of work done. They know where the pressure points are, particularly in places in, the, in areas like social care. Uh, which is going to be difficult in terms of workforce, uh, they think. Uh, and then individually, some councils like Highland uh, very quickly did a very thorough piece of work um, after the referendum, uh, setting out the potential implications for, for the Highland region. So, so and, and obviously, COSLA have been, have been active in this space as well. So, so, kind of impressionistically, we can see lots of stuff happening. And as the chair says, we've asked auditors this year to to have a look so that we'll have a, a better, stronger evidence base towards the end of this year to see what's actually happening on the ground. And in terms of budgetary terms in relation to that, because we're going to be looking at our budget process in terms of inputs, is there financial, additional financial support the Scottish Government have to give in relation to managing some of those those risks? Or is it more a, is it more a kind of a policy landscape and a reassurance? I mean, do you get a sense of what needs to happen? So so the starting point for us is to is to get some assurance that councils themselves are aware of the implications in the three areas that the chair has described financial being an important part of that um, and, of, and they have a pretty clear sense of how much european money they get at the moment the next question then is well what happens um, beyond uh, uh, beyond exit uh, and that i guess is is the million dollar question that we're that we're all looking to answer of course i acknowledge there's there's, there's european funds but i was obviously thinking about what workforce as well. You mentioned social care. Sorry, Mr Sharp, did you want to... Uh, no, I, I was just going to say that, that on, on the Brexit issue generally, you know, we all have this this problem that we, we have no idea what shape any deal uh, will be and therefore what the consequences of that will be. So I think all one can do, and it's not entirely satisfactory, is identify where the exposures are. Um, and, and as we've said, I think for local authorities, you've got funding exposure, you've got the regulatory exposure, and you've got the workforce. So, so they, they need to know 
how many people they're employing, what areas they're in, are there concentrations in particular areas, and but but whether one's looking at all those people leaving or some of them leaving or um, them staying on different terms. I mean, no one has a uh, a view on that at the moment. I mean, if, if we were talking about um, budget, so like, one one year budgets at a time is not ideal, but you're applying five, ten years. Um, and I know local authorities say, well, what would we do if we had a 2% increase or a 2% cut or a 4%? And they do modelling work over what their, their actual responses would be on the ground to setting budgets. So should local authorities be, once they've done that, what the demographics of the workforce are and the profile is, should they be saying, well, if these employees go, what's for plan B? If 50% of them go, what's for plan C? And so on. Is it just about the exposure or is it actually about planning ahead irrespective of what the deal looks like? Because that's what they have to do with the finances well, in a year on year. And indeed, that's that's what the auditors will report on to, to what they're doing. But, but in terms of what impact that, that will have across across the piece, I think one needs a, a, a bit more um, sort of clarity in, in what situation we're, we're, we would be facing. That, that was the point I was making. Okay, that's helpful in health and social care. I'm we'll, we will extend a session in relation to the budget scrutiny element. I think we might have to do that. Even if we curtail the Alios one slightly, and apologies for that. But in, in relate, health and social care was, was mentioned. Was certainly mentioned in relation to workforce and a lot of the workforce in the EU and actually internationally beyond that as well. A lot of that workforce, a lot of that workforce could be in Alios. We we'll, might look at that in the next session. A lot of that workforce might be in third sector care homes, for example. Um, so, and, and I just look, looked quickly online there. So, the Integrated Joint Board for Glasgow on the 20, 21st of March this year uh, set a budget increasing £2.38 million to, for the National Care Homes, the, their share of the National Care Homes settlement and contract, including everyone getting a, at least a living wage of £8.75 from the start of May this year. Not all employed by the local authority, some of them in Alios, some of them in the third and private sector, but they're essentially performing uh, local authority statutory duties in relation to all of this. So do we know the size of that workforce? Do look, are local authorities very clear in planning ahead in relation to that workforce? So, so I think my response is convenient. they should be. So I can't tell you whether they are or they aren't as we sit here today, and that's part of the, the work that we're hoping to to get a bit more on. But yes, you would, to be honest, irrespective of of leaving the EU, you would we would absolutely expect a local authority to understand how the care system works in its area and to be planning on the basis of that. And as you say, that will include voluntary and private sector providers as much as it will everything else. So, um, so yes, they, they should have a good sense of that, and obviously. To take your point, we we are expecting them to to do more than just say this is probably going to have some kind of impact on our social care workforce. They should also, as you've suggested, have some scenarios in mind about what happens if, uh, and that's the kind of stuff we would expect to see this year. So the reason for asking that question is just to, well, workforce planning. Who's doing the workforce planning? Because um, I mentioned the Integrated Joint Board, which is a separate organisation from the council, despite the relationship with the council. That's also why I mentioned the £355 million that doesn't feature in relation to the revenue support. But there's an example of that money being spent on the ground, supporting uh, local authority duties. So who does the workforce planning in relation to third sector and private care home staff, local authority staff, when ALIOs are setting budgets on this? How do we get, so not ALIOs, apologies, integrated joint boards are setting budgets around this? Confusion. So, uh, well, potentially, and that's part. Of the, so that's in a sense the the point of having integrated joint boards is that it brings together all the different bits of the system in one place. I, I go back to my comment earlier that we need to remember that different IGBs have different services in scope. But just to focus on the adult social care bit for a second, absolutely, the IGB as the as the planning and commissioning body for that area should have a strong sense of the delivery system in its area, which includes whether it's an alio, a private sector or a, or a voluntary sector care provider, and they should be able to commission uh, services based on the, the budget that they receive from their council and their health board. So I'm just trying to, final question, I know Mr Simpson wants to come in a supplementary on this. Um, 
in terms of workforce planning in the social care sector to make sure we have got enough uh, residential beds, enough step down beds, enough care at home staff, uh, and you know uh, the, whole, the whole gambit of social care services. A lot of these budgets have been set by the integrated joint board, but a lot of people are employed by the council, even though IGBs are putting the money in. A lot of it is contracted to the third and private sector. Who's doing the work? Whose responsibility is it to do the workforce planning then, if you're not in control of all the budgets in relation to that? So the IGB is. Now, clearly, and, and I guess in terms of the, the setting the budget, it's worth remembering that the IGB gets its budget in the first place from the Council and the Health Board, uh -huh. which is a process itself. Um, and then the IGB has to satisfy itself that the budget it's receiving from those two places is sufficient for them to then deliver what they need to deliver. But as I say, in terms of adult social care, um, even though they don't, uh, IGBs don't employ people directly, the system we have is that they are responsible for ensuring that everything's in place to deliver the services that are required based on, on local need. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr Simpson? Yeah, slightly uh, different direction, uh, convener. Um, uh, back to exhibit one. Um, and you mentioned, um, well, basically several areas where nas national government policies can cost potentially councils money, um, education, reform, for, for example, where you say financial implications uh, are unclear, uh, the Barclay review of non-domestic rates, you say that could cost an, uh, an extra £80 million, uh, pounds, and it's not clear whose responsibility, who's responsible for those costs. Uh, and then we look at early learning and childcare. Um, I don't think anyone would disagree that you know there should be a, a, an expansion of that, but it costs money. Um, and councils uh, appear to be unclear. Well, in fact, they are unclear. I know from uh, the council area where, where I live, South Lanarkshire, um, the extra money from the government um, has has changed. They they don't know how much. Well, it's gone down. Um, so yeah, you know, there, there, there is a lack of clarity. Uh, and in fact, in your report, early learning and childcare, you say there are risks. That the councils won't be able to deliver the additional hours. So I suppose, I mean, it's the same theme, but do councils, when national government, whoever that government is, uh, announce policies, do they require extra clarity uh, than they're actually getting? Well, I, I think one of the reasons we had the clarity com column was, was just to point up where... Um, issues had, hadn't yet been clarified to a point where everyone knew exactly where they, they were. And, and clearly, when you have national policies that either need to be delivered locally or they um, interact with other services that are delivered locally, uh, local government as, as a sort of local delivery end is, is critically important and how that all that joins up needs to work. So there needs to be good communication of exactly what's expected and how it's being funded. Um, and I mean, as, as, as you pointed out, in, in a number of these areas, when, when we produced the report, we noted where it, it, it appeared that, that there were still details to be, to be thrashed out or, or in some cases agreed um, to, to, to bring that clarity uh, and until that's done in, in each case, um, there, there is a question mark over exactly how, does, how it's going to work, both in terms of its efficacy and scope and, and, and the burden on, on councils, yes. So, uh, I mean, if we look at early learning and childcare, what are the, how high are the risks that councils won't be able to deliver? Um, so, since we published that report, you'll, you'll know, Mr Simpson, that this government and COSLA did reach agreement on, on how much it was going to be. I think it was a figure of about eight, £980 million pounds they ended up on in the end. At the time of writing that report, there were councils were saying a number that was quite a lot bigger than the government's number, and they've kind of met somewhere in the middle, as far as I can tell, um, which is, which I guess is what happens, uh, and, and genuinely make no comment about that. Um, so. And, and, you know, there is an argument that says at the point of introducing some of these significant policy changes and shifts, it is really quite difficult to put an exact number on it that everyone's going to sign up to. So I think there is an entirely legitimate process to go through to figure out 
well, actually, what does this mean on the ground? I think the point we're trying to make here in early learning and childcare is a great example because it touched on everything. It had hugely significant workforce uh, implications. It had hugely significant uh, capital investment and infrastructure. So actually physically having to build new, new nurseries was a thing. Um, uh, and so the money, it's not just about the money, it's about then the capacity of the system to implement the changes required in real life to ensure that um, uh, people are able to get the additional hours that were that were that have been promised. So that is a really good example. And I guess the point that we're trying to make in Exhibit One is, it's only one example, and even that on its own would be, you know, significant enough for people to to get their head around. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Mr. Simpson, with your permission, we'll leave that hanging. There are a couple of final questions. Run this at the very latest uh, until half past eleven. We'll get a quick quick turnover in relation to that. Um, I cut Mr Whiteman off earlier. I think I have to put Mr Whiteman first, but I'll just give a name check. Mr Whiteman, Mr Gibson, and then the final question from our Deputy Convener, Monica Lennon, and hopefully by... OK, and the final question by Jenny Goldruff. <laughs> let's see how we go on doing that. But efficiency saving, if we can do that in 15 minutes, let me tell you, Mr Whiteman. OK, just very briefly. I mean, it, again, coming back to transformational um, change, I mean, we, we all attend public meetings, Jenny Goldruth was talking about GPs. I was at a meeting last night about planning in the city, where the citizens have got lots of angst about what's happening and what needs to change, and there's a lot of frustration with, this, with the system in, in general. The Irish referendum last week on the Eighth Amendment was really interesting, because that started off with a citizens' assembly of 99 randomly selected people who basically scoped the whole issue and initiate that whole process of change through Parliament, and ultimately to a referendum question. Is there scope in terms of transformation to do better engagement with the citizen by trusting the citizen uh, and trusting um, uh, things like citizens' assemblies to come up with the kind of ideas, test them out, map them, consider them, um, and ultimately come to uh, change that's going to have more trust and more buy-in by the, by the electorate? Is that something you're looking at because you, you know you mentioned small teams of people in corporate back offices I mean with all the due respect that you can do a, a lot of work inside the system to transform it but ultimately it's the people who receive the services who have a lot to say about how those services should be delivered and could perhaps be more in the driving seat well a, a couple of things to that I mean first of all generally um, we've very much um, encouraged councils to uh, include communities in the transformation process in terms of of finding out what what outcomes and uh, are required in different areas and, and different ways of, of delivering them. I mean that's that's part of the transformation process. Um, in in terms of what people are doing to include communities, it, I mean it varies across across the the country and and the whole um, community and empowerment move is is still developing and um, I think everyone's learning from different things but I mean um, yesterday we published uh, East Ayrshire and there um, there are uh, quite a few examples of, of active engagement with communities and and doing exactly the sort of things you're, you're talking about Olvin communities are consulting them I'm talking about handing over a set of problems, let's just say for the sake of your argument, the challenges you present in Exhibit 1, to something like a Citizens' Assembly, resource it. I mean, the Irish Citizens' Assembly worked very, very intensively. Um, they gave up weekends and all the rest of it over the course of about a, a year. Hand that over. Th that's what I'm talking about. I'm not just talking about better consultation and all the rest of it. I'm talking about where the changes come from. Who's driving it? Well, I, I think... In Apologise to Mr Whiteman for, for this interjection. Um, I'm really keen to hear what the answer is to that. It's a fascinating question, but we are here to discuss the challenges and performances 2018 uh, Accounts Commission report. And as fascinating as it is, we might be getting a slight mission drift. Mr Sharp. So I think all I would say briefly then, Convener, is that, so to, so to be clear, when we're talking about community engagement and empowerment, we are also talking about much more than consultation whether that's a citizens' assembly, there are lots of different ways you can you can do it. I think our short answer would be yes, there is absolutely more scope for communities to be involved much earlier in a process in, in not, not being presented with some options about what do you think about these things we've come up with, but a much more um, first principles discussion about 
the kind of place you want it to be and, the, and how we'd, how communities would see um, some of the challenges in here, uh, you know, progressed and met. So, so the short answer, I think, is is yes. There's absolutely more scope for that. Okay. Um, thank you. Now, Mr. Gibson. Yes, thanks very much. Convener, it's actually on the key messages, part one, and it is on the community empowerment. I mean, wh one of the things you say in key message four is that in 2016, only 23% of adults agreed they can influence decisions affecting the local area. No doubt that's why we have fairly low turnouts at local elections. Um, in the same paragraph, you say that uh, new legislation involves councils developing fresh approaches to community empowerment. <coughs> Some examples of good work taking place, including new ways in which councils consult with, listen to, and work with local people and communities and you've said indeed that there are but you haven't given us any examples of those and I'm just wondering if you can perhaps give us uh, one or two examples of those um, certainly and if it would be helpful we can we can follow up uh, with a couple of those uh, Mr Gibson but um, the chair mentioned the report that the commission published this week in East Ayrshire uh, and while by, by no means would, would you say that they've absolutely cracked it, their um, vibrant communities approach, we think, is really very good uh, in terms of in, uh, genuinely involving local communities in thinking about how services are designed. And I think the, the interesting thing about the, the vibrant communities model is that it's pretty central to how the whole organisation is run. So I think we see quite a lot of quite interesting community engagement initiatives, whether it be charrettes or different ways of involving communities in, in different decisions. But they do, they do tend to be quite um, uh, discreet, I guess. The interesting thing about East Ayrshire is that for quite a long time now, they've had that model baked into how they run their organisation. And you can see all sorts of benefit for that. So, um, but happy to follow up with, with a couple of specifics, if that would be helpful. That would be helpful. Thanks, yeah. Kavir. Um, Monica Lennon. Thanks, Kibira. I just wanted to turn to, I guess, the final page of the report, but it's really important stuff. Um, and you did mention earlier on, Mr Sharp, about the, the sort of reduction to regulatory functions within councils. Um, there's a couple of different departments mentioned um, planning, so I'll refer to my register of interest, because the RTPI um, have identified a 23% reduction in staffing and planning teams since 2009. And this committee has been scrutinising the, the planning bill, so we have a, a keen interest in that. But trading standards, COSLA have reported a 20% decrease in the in the workforce. So, you know, you're rightly saying in your report that um, these departments and, and others that are similar provide important services to communities, such as inspecting uh, building standards and public health. So there's a, a risk that staffing pressures and budget cuts could lead to errors with potentially serious consequences to the public. But I also see that the Commission reported this back in 2013, um, that the long-term viability of Council's trading standard services is under threat, potentially leaving consumers without important protection. So it sounds potentially very serious. Um, my kind of take on this is that local government has been hollowed out. Um, I just wonder, when we look at these figures, you know, what, what can be done to, to rebuild these services? And, you know, I wish I could say that, you know, people are still delivering the same service with less staff, but on trading standards, Unison have got a report out today and some of their members are saying, for example, consumer protection is at an all-time low. In over 30 years of trading standard service, I have never known morale to be so low. So it's not a great time to be working in local government. What can be done to turn this around? Well, I think, as, as we've been saying, um, there are very significant challenges for local government at the moment, and it does need, need a, a different way of organising themselves and, and different ways of, of providing services. Um, and that is a process that, that everyone, to some degree or other, is, is having to go through. Um, it, it's, it's necessary for local government to perform its function for, for all the services to be provided at an adequate level, not, not just the protected services. So that has to be built in to the transformational change. Clearly, as, as a direction, that, that, that can't go on um, forever. I mean, there comes a point where you, you can't um, do any more. But, but we, we are not saying that we're at that point at the moment, but, but it is very challenging and, and uh, significant change is the order of the day, if you like, and, and councils are 
in different degrees engaging with that and it, it, it's it's a sort of moving process and we, we need to keep monitoring it and see where things are and, and share good practice where we find good practice um, point up issues where we see issues and um, as best we can work with, with local government as, as they go through this. I, I'm not sure we can say... I, th I think the only other thing I would add is that in response to the 2013 report you mentioned um, the Improvement Service in COSLA did put in place some national uh, initiatives to support those services, uh, particularly around workforce. Uh, and encouraging people to come into the professions. But it also seems to me, and, and we're thinking that that might be an area that the Commission might follow up in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, this, this seems to me an area that has to be ripe for more shared working and more joint working across councils. Um, and, and I think that has to be one of the potential solutions to, um, to managing, the, um, to managing the, the challenges that we've described on page 38 there. Just to clarify, um, Fraser McKinley, you, you mentioned um, work being done to attract people into to these roles. I mean, my understanding is, particularly speaking to people who work in planning, a, a job that I used to do, so I still have a lot of contacts there. You know, these are posts that are being, you know, sort of voluntarily made redundant and posts that are not being filled. And the people who are, are left working in departments, they're not having enough CPD or training or career progression. So. Um, why is there work being done to attract more people in if the jobs are not there? So at the time, uh, and, and I can double check this, but at the time it, was, it, was a, it wasn't just about bringing people in, but that was part of the problem. There was, there was something about um, the pipeline, if you like, of professionals coming through. Um, but you're absolutely right, that's, that's against the backdrop of the, the number of jobs reducing and, and increased pressure on those services locally. So it was looking at how they alleviate, alleviate all of those things. Uh, I think, as I've said, the Commission have this in there uh, as a potential audit for their kind of medium term programme in the next couple of years because we think, it, as this report says, we do think there's still lots of evidence that those uh, services are still under significant pressure. Okay. And just a final question on that because when I've raised issues um, about local government finance um, with the government, they've replied that local government has been treated very fairly um, by the Scottish, Scottish government. One of the, the options that available to councils, I suppose, given the, the limited financial autonomy, autonomy that Andy Whiteman has outlined, is to um, introduce charges. Is that something that councils are looking at in terms of some of these statutory functions? Um, Certainly, I, th I think we note in this report and, and just generally from our BV work, um, I mean, councils are certainly looking at, at ways to raise revenue, which um, has, has principally been on, on fees and charges. Um, I, I think there's um, also more uh, of, of uh, a, 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 an appetite for looking at maybe other ways to, to raise revenues. As you know, in England, there's been much more sort of commercial uh, activity by councils that hasn't been so much the case in Scotland but um, certainly it's something some councils are looking at but it's still mainly focused on, on fees and charges. Okay, thank okay. you. And uh, final question from Jenny Horuth, MSP. Thank you, Convener. Um, one of the main themes today has been transformational change uh, and obviously the budget challenges currently being faced. And I note in the report you say there can be difficulties recruiting to the top team as salaries are often lower than in the private sector at senior levels. So I'd like to ask at a specific point then. Uh, in Fife Council, the Chief Executive is currently on a remuneration package of over £200,000, so more than, than the Prime Minister, more than the First Minister. North Lanarkshire has 18 staff earning over £100,000. Edinburgh's Council Finance Director earned over £500,000 last year. Um, does Audit Scotland have a view with regard to the, how you know, we pay council officials? Because I do think there's a disconnect here in terms of talking about the wider budget constraints of councils at the moment and actually the pay in the public sector being extremely high in some instances. I, mean, I, I think um, you, you picked out some specific examples. I think if we, if we, if we look over the piece um, uh, and you look at areas where you are competing with the private sector, um, I, I think that there is a disparity if you look, say, at specialist areas like um, finance or some specialist engineering or digital, um, where everyone's trying to find digital experts. You do, you do get, you know, senior to get a good senior digital person is, is quite a struggle. 
um, across councils it varies. I mean, uh, at the moment, uh, Clack Manager are recruiting, and I, I, I think um, one of their issues may be that, I'm, I'm not sure about this, but I, I think their salary, because of the size of their council for the chief executive, is is probably less than, than heads of service in some other areas. So, so that, that might be an issue. So I think it is a mixed day position, but, but I, I think the point is still a fair one. I mean, Fraser, have you got a...? No, I mean, I think it's... Um, so I, I guess the, the, the short answer is we don't really have a view about whether that's right, wrong or, or, or indifferent. Um, it's a scale that's set nationally. Um, the, the numbers you're quoting there will include the, the pension entitlement and other things, so the, the, the actual salary will be uh, a good bit lower than that in those cases. And I suppose my final reflection is that these are, and genuinely I make no judgment about whether it's the right amount or not, but these are very big and complicated organisations uh, to run, and um, even where you're not uh, directly competing in, in a private sector employment market, we have seen councils um, struggle to recruit um, uh, top people, and you mentioned one or two councils that have got a number of folk over £100,000. Um, what I would also observe is that we've, th the strong trend that we've observed over the last f five to ten years is top teams in councils becoming much, much smaller. So lots of councils now will have three executive directors running uh, the whole organisation, which, if I'm honest, brings its own degree of risk. So so it's um, I'm, I'm kind of ducking the question, um, but I think it's it's for ultimately, you know, it's for councillors to decide um, what they think those jobs are worth. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, question, Mr. McKinley, you thought about a career in politics once, once, once this one's over. You, you never know. Um, we we haven't asked this. That I'm just going to please don't answer this question, but it's remiss of me. We, we we did have a note we really should ask about additional pressures in relation to wage constraint, if you like, been loosened a bit and the the, the kind of aspiration for a 3% cap, but still 3% wage increase, that's a pressure. Um, it will be mentioned within the report, but anything additional supplementary you want to give to us that might link to workforce planning and financial pressures, I think would be welcome going forward in relation to that. That, that would be very helpful. Um, so whilst I, I thank you all for, for your attendance, can I, can I thank Ashley Majesty just now for, for coming along, because the other three of you are stuck with us for a little bit longer. Uh, so thank you, Ashley. As we now uh, move for agenda item one, we'll suspend briefly before we move to agenda item two. Thank you.
Uh, good morning and welcome back everyone. We now move to agenda item 2, Council's use of arm's length organisations. The committee will take evidence from the Council's Commission on its report, Council's use of arm's length organisations. And I welcome once more, Graeme Sharp, Fraser McKinley, Ronnie Nicholl. Apologies for not giving you your full Sunday titles there, gentlemen, but you were with us for the previous evidence session. Thank you very much for that. And we're also joined by uh, Derek Coy, Auditor, Performance Audit and Best Value Audit Scotland. Thank you all of you for uh, coming along. Um, Mr Sharp, some opening remarks would be very welcome. Thank you. The Accounts Commission welcomes the opportunity to discuss our Council's use of arm's length external organisations report with the committee. Virtually all councils make use to some degree of arm's length organisations. They take many forms, including companies, community bodies and charities. They provide a range of services, including sports and leisure, museums and theatres, social care and more commercial activities such as property management. Their use has grown over the last 20 years and we estimate that there are about 130 alios in total in Scotland, accounting for an annual spend of more than £1.3 billion. A report gives an update on Council's use of alios. It builds on our earlier work around governance, including our 2011 How Councils Work guidance on the subject. An alio structure may deliver tax benefits, and we found that taxation advantages have been a strong driver for charitable alios. Operational benefits of alios include their ability to trade more widely and access new funding or sponsorship. Alios may also bring a more commercial or responsive delivery model under a board of directors or trustees. We report that there is evidence that alios do bring benefits to services, and we give examples from sports and leisure and social care as two prominent service areas where alios have been deployed. However, we note that financial pre pressures remain and alios bring particular risks that need to be managed. We found that councils undertake detailed planning and appraisals for alios, but we report that they could do more to involve the public, communities and businesses in this process. We see improving practice in how councils manage their relationships with alios and oversee them. For example, scrutiny that's proportionate to risk, council committees looking at performance and strategic decisions, and officers taking a stronger role in monitoring finances, risks and governance. That said, issues may still arise over the operation or governance of our alios, and we highlight some of these in our report. We emphasise that regardless of how services are delivered, councils must apply the following the public pound code to ensure safeguards are in place over how they use public money. Finally, we describe the changing context in which alios operate. This includes questions over future taxation benefits to councils following the Scottish Government's response to the Barclay Review, funding pressures and the changing policy environment in areas such as community engagement and health and social care integration. This means it is even more important for councils to have a strong case for using alios and to consider alternatives. Indeed, options appraisal is an important theme to our best value work in councils. It follows that councils must keep their alios under review to ensure they continue to meet their intended objectives. We will continue to look at alios in our ongoing audit and best value work in individual councils. Convener, my colleagues and I are again happy to answer questions. Thank you, very much, Mr Sharp. That's very helpful. We'll move to our first question from Andy Whiteman, MSP. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, your report and your opening remarks indicate that alios come in, in various shapes and, and sizes, but is there any defining feature of an alio? Like, what is an alio? <laughs> I think uh, I, I'm, t I'm tempted to say the defining feature is that there isn't a defining feature. Um, no, they come in, in all shapes and sizes. They, they are uh, employed in, in different areas of activity. Um, and the, 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 the key element I, is really that they are some form of organisation, which can be a company, a community body, a partnership, um, a trust that is separate from the council, has a, a separate decision making body in, in respect of its operations and strategy from the council. 
and, and it carries out activities for the council. Uh, it may carry out additional activities, but, but there is um, a, a link in, in its activities to, to the council's um, uh, wish to, to supply services to its citizens. Ultimately, this comes down to governance, in a sense. The strategic plan, the annual report, are signed off by a body which is not the full council. Um, that governance is what one aspect of it. Um, I, th I think there's a structural aspects which are, are, are very specific. Um, I mean, the main structural benefit of an alio, if you like, is, is a tax benefit that, that accrues only to charitable alios. There's, there's a governance issue, an information flow issue, and, but there's also an operational side, um, because as we've said in the report, there are arguments in, in, in specific situations that a, a, a focus on specific activities from a group of people that might not necessarily uh, work uh, for a council body um, can bring benefits. So I think there's operational governance and, and structural. So for example, here in Edinburgh, we have a, a wholly owned municipal bus company called Lothian Buses. Uh, is that an alio? Yes, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned in your report that, um, and I think you, you, you hinted that in England, a lot of alios are used for quite commercial purposes. Yes. Now, again, I'm, I like to kind of dig into history here, but municipal corporations in Scotland used to do a lot of enterprises. They had energy companies, transport companies. Um, so in a sense, nothing's new here. Um, but it seems to me that alios emerged a bit by accident rather than design. I mean, they've kind of, could you say something about, you know, the, the genesis of the modern alio? Well, I, I think, as you say, there have always been bodies associated with the provision of services by councils that have been separate but linked, separate from the council yet linked to the council. Um, I suppose alios, as we see them now, um, emerged in the sort of public eye as a result of perhaps some some high-profile events and and also a, a, a burst of alio growth uh, some years ago. Now, um, I, I think um, there, at one point the, the tax benefit of charitable alios was was uh, quite a strong incentive, and it was promoted. Um, to councils by, by certain advisors, and a, a number of alios were set up um, with that as a, as a strong benefit. So I think there, there, there was a growth in alios plus some, some high profile events, and that's probably why the perception of alios sort of emerged, as it were, rather than the alio itself. So moving on to the, um, you mentioned the, um, the charitable status of alios, clearly that uh, enables them to attract uh, extra funds, and you, you highlight some of that, which is obviously uh, important. Um, you also highlight the, the Barclay Review's proposals to end um, their eligibility for charitable relief for non-domestic rates. That proposal is not being taken forward, but constraints are being placed on any future ability to to um, create alios and get that relief by offsetting it. Um, but you say in paragraph 17, um, business cases identify NDR relief as a specific benefit provided the alio meets the requirements for charitable status. And you're going to say, while NDR relief can bring benefits locally, it offers no net financial gain to the public sector. Um, that's true. You've said that. It offers no net financial gain. So why all this fuss? Well, I, uh, I'm, the comment on the public sector is looking at the public sector as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you, you'll appreciate that from an economic point of view, taxes aren't, aren't a cost, they're a transfer uh, with, within the public sector. So if, if you look at the total public sector, a public body saving tax isn't... A, a net gain because their gain is, is, is a loss somewhere else. However, um, there are different levels of the public sector. Um, so what, from a, a national point of view, a UK national point of view, is a no gain, no loss. 
could be a gain or loss to, say, the, the Scottish Government, and what is a, a, a no gain or no loss to the Scottish Government might be a gain or loss to a specific um, local authority. So if, if you're a local authority that, that, that's faced with financial pressure and you can do something two ways, one of them through an alio and one of them not through an alio, and the only difference, everything else being equal, is that if you, if you do it through a charitable alio, you, you actually save some tax. That, from your perspective, is a saving in cost, and, and you'd be able to, to deploy those funds elsewhere. But, but from a total public sector point of view, it, it wouldn't be a saving in cost. So does that not suggest that we should be considering regulating alios because they are essentially used to gain competitive advantage? Well, well certainly the market mechanism is um, a, a perfectly valid uh, way of allocating resources. And to the extent that um, a tax benefit to, to certain players in the market gives them an advantage, it, it uh, distorts the market mechanism as, as an allocator of, of um, resources. So that, that's a, a, a valid line of argument. And you also mentioned in your opening remarks that um, there are questions around the extent to which the public is engaged and involved in, 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 in alios. Um, and yet I think you say in your report that actually um, public satisfaction with alios, generally speaking, is, is pretty high. Mm -hmm. Um, why, why is that? Well, I, I think we're, we're looking at, at different things here. I, th I think we, we in particular noted that, that when um, councils are looking at, at setting up an alio structure, um, we didn't um, find evidence that there was uh, good um, engagement with uh, the public and communities over, over the different options and, and going for an alio rather than something else. But we did note that, in, that many alios themselves um, did have good engagement with, with the public. And, and as you'd see, they also, um, there was evidence of good performance by alios, which would result in public satisfaction. So the two things aren't inconsistent. OK, thanks. Um, can I explore, looking for bids for questions from members, but can I just explore what, what, one matter? Um, we've got, got a few volunteers now. So, controversial decision made by an alio in Glasgow, Glasgow Life, in relation to concessionary swimming. Um, now, the council agrees a budget the, the, the Glasgow Life has, and it cuts its cloth accordingly, and then it does a business plan in relation to that. So, for example, uh, pensioners got free swimming in Glasgow, um, it will now be £3 a swim, but low-income pensioners will be £1 a swim. Very controversial. The constituents contact me about it. Taking both sides of the right thing or wrong thing to do, but I've been contacted about it by constituents. Um, the logic would appear to be that most uh, pensioners that were using the free swim were in higher income brackets, uh, and when surveyed said they actually probably wouldn't mind paying uh, to swim. So low-income brackets a pound, everyone else three pounds, the money allegedly then targeted to target groups who might be less likely to use Glasgow Life facilities. Hugely controversial uh, in Glasgow, unsure where the accountability sits in the round in relation to that, but in terms of outcomes, um, should, that, should Glasgow Life be very clear? Who monitors Glasgow Life other than Glasgow City Council to make sure they're meeting the outcomes they say? So this time next year, as a Glasgow MSP, I'm interested to know, well actually, has the number of uh, pensioners swimming went down in Glasgow? Has the number of pensioners swimming from more deprived groups, has that went up in Glasgow? Th there seems a lack of clarity in following through in what would appear to be a policy decision on one level, uh, but it's unclear whether that becomes a politician's policy decision or whether that becomes a business decision on behalf of the ALIO. So that's still evolving in Glasgow. You might not be able to comment on that, but do you have other examples across the country where there seems a blur between what is a business decision by the ALIO, what is a policy decision by the local authority, and who's actually measuring the outcomes after those decisions have been made? Well, I, I, I think that's illustrating one of the main points we make about the use of ALIOs, which is that um, if you are setting up an ALIO, you've got to be very clear about what your objectives are. 
and you've got to be very clear that those objectives are built in to the arrangements you have with the ALEO and that there is a way of monitoring them and, and in effect holding the ALEO to account for its performance against those objectives. So in, in that example, and I, obviously I don't know any of the details, if the objective is to increase the number of pensioners using the pool, that would, that would lead to one set of um, uh, behaviours. If, if, it's, if it's to not charge any pensioner more than a, a certain amount, that, that's a different objective. Um, so it really depends how they've set out the objectives and, and how they're monitoring performance against those objectives. But I suppose my question, I mean, that, that'll b bottom itself out in Glasgow, and I'll certainly make representations to both the administration and Glasgow Life in relation to that, and how they'll track that forward and be held to account for whatever outcomes are or are not achieved in, in, in relation to that. But it just seemed a kind of a kind of real time example of Alio's inaction at a local level, where decisions they make can be controversial. So I, I, I'm just wondering whether the Council Commission's taken a more a wider view, a broader view in relation to whether how disengaged they think alios are from the communities they serve, or are they getting it just about right? And what can be done to to change that situation? Well, I, th I think in in terms of the evidence, we don't have any evidence that alios are systemically disengaged. Um, uh, I think the alio structure itself. Um, has to be considered separate from, from the management of, of the ALEO. Um, many of the, the issues that, that might be raised in a service that's provided by an ALEO might equally be raised in another council but by, on the service not being supplied by an, an ALEO, and it's down to, to management. So, so again, that comes down to when you set the object, when you have in mind setting up an ALEO, you have to be clear about the purpose, clear about the objectives, and those objectives need to be built into the, the, the monitoring and performance structure so, so you can be assured that, that the ALEO operates in that way. Um, that is slightly different, but not necessarily um, more difficult than, than if you're running um, a, 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 a council service internally, and certainly in terms of how it performs in public perception. I, I don't think we found any evidence that that one is systemically better than another. I mean, do, do so I think that was the point I was going to make. Is that one one of the tricky things about this piece of work for the team has been prescribing what's happening to the to the alioness or not, because actually it's entirely possible for for a council department to be completely disengaged from its communities as much as it is an alio, I think, that is the point that, that the chair's making. I think you, you absolutely touch on the key point, though, convener, which is what's important there for us is the extent to which, first of all, that Glasgow life in that case uh, would apply everywhere, are able to explain the rationale for that, for that decision, and then are reporting on the impact of that decision. And then second of all, that in this case, Glasgow City Council, through their governance arrangements, is actually asking exactly the same kind of questions as you are. So what difference has this policy change made? I think, interestingly, what we heard in speaking to people who work in alios is that they would potentially argue the flip side, which is, in a way, it's easier um, for alios to take some potentially controversial decisions, which they believe be to be in the best interests of local communities and the service, free from what they might call the politics of a, of a particular situation. So so you kind of, you know, pays your monies and take your choice on that one, I think. Poor Glasgow Life, she put out, I'm not suggesting they're disengaged, I'm just trying to get a picture of across the country and that the proof, proof that Putin will be needing, so this time next year we'll, we'll, get, we'll get a matrix of what's actually happened with swimming in Glasgow and we'll find out whether that was a good decision in relation to public service, a good decision commercially, and that will all bottom itself out. But it's just an example, a real life example of how we want to make sure that when alios make decisions, they're accountable for them and we're actually measuring the outcomes. So I, I found that helpful, Mr Gibson. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Convener. Uh, you do, you're not very keen, as Exhibit 10 seems to indicate, on councils being on alios. For example, you give three advantages of having council nominees as board directors and trustees but six disadvantages. Are you suggesting on balance that councils shouldn't really serve on alios? Um, I, I think councils need to <coughs> consider carefully why they are putting a councillor 
on the board of an LAO because there are clearly disadvantages of a councillor being on an LAO board, specifically their ability to contribute to discussion on, on the monitoring, funding and performance review of the LAO is, is limited. Um, and um, the, so it depends why do you want the council on the board? Is it, is it just, is it to contribute to the board? If, if that's the reason that there are other ways of doing it, you, you, you could put an independent person on for the council, for example. Um, is, it, is it to monitor what the LEO is doing? Well, that isn't probably going to work terribly well because of the constraints. And there are other ways of doing that that are probably more robust, such as uh, writing it into the documentation when you set the LEO up and the, and the contractual arrangements between the council and, and the LEO. Is, is it to give local people a voice because it, it's operating in a particular local area? Well, well, that, that might be a, a good idea. There, there might be other ways of doing that as well. You might actually get representatives from local community on, on, on the board. But I think what we're saying is you just need to think very carefully about why the councillor is, is, is going on the board and you don't find yourself in a position where you put people on the board in a general way, thinking, well, we'd like them to, to keep an eye on what's going on, and then you find that, in fact, they're constrained from doing the thing that you had in your mind when you put them on. Or indeed, you have a conflict of interest situation where yeah. they, they seem to be serving interests, perhaps, of their, the council or their political party, as opposed to the needs of the alley or itself, mm -hmm. and well, the delivery of those services. Well, certainly, um, I mean, that goes into another area of, of if you are serving in an alley or you need, you need to know or be, have training to know what your obligations in serving as a trustee or, or a director of a company or whatever it is are. And, and generally, your obligations are to that organisation uh, and, and not any, anyone else. You can't serve as a representative of somebody else. You have to serve the, the organisation as, as a board member or a trustee. Um, but um, it, it's just, it, it's not straightforward. You, you, I mean, there, there, there's a, a case um, that we investigated some years ago now where there were councillors sitting on the board of an alio. The alio was in f financial difficulties. The council was the main funder. The council continued to fund the alio because um, it didn't know about the financial difficulties and the councillors couldn't, couldn't say anything about the financial difficulties because they, they were on the board of the alio and were constrained by um, their duties as a director of, of a company, which was, I believe, explained to them by the, the then company's lawyers. And, and you don't want to find yourself in that sort of situation. And the way around that is to be clear what you expect from councillors on, on the board and in terms certainly of information and monitoring to make sure you have proper contractual or other legal arrangements to do that and, and you're not just relying on people on the board because they can't perform that function. Thanks. I'm hearing loud and clear that there seems to be a, 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 um, you know, a, no great enthusiasm for councillors being on LEOs, but would, can, can I ask, has the, the Accounts Commission done any work to suggest if there's any difference in terms of the outcome, in terms of service delivery values with councillors on them and those who may not have councillors on them? Is, uh, do the councillors prove to, to assist in general or be a drag on, on that? Because what we've seen in some of the figures that you presented to us, for example, you've talked about five councillors seeing a 50% reduction in cost and a 50% increase in service uptake for sports and leisure. You've, you've illustrated how effectively the alio uh, of Lothian Buses is delivering Highland Life, some cooperation uh, that's going on between the uh, alio initiatives with regard to wider social and community benefits, uh, for example, quote in Edinburgh Leisure uh, and Leisure and Culture in Dundee, etc. So I'm just wondering if the, if the Council's presence um, has had any impact in terms of the overall delivery, good or bad. Well, I think there are two things there. One was um, whether we'd done any work on any correlation between councillor presence and, and performance, and I, I would imagine we had not done that. Um, and then there's an attribution of cause as to whether, uh, if a councillor is on, on, on the board, that in itself is, is the reason for um, superior performance, if, if that is, is the case. Are they making the LEO work more efficiently and effectively yeah. rather than to deliver a drag <laughs> but, on its performance? But, but to be clear, I wasn't saying councillors should not be on the board. Right. I'm saying um, councillors need to be very clear about why the councillors on the board and and the sort of um, 
historical um, straightforward reaction of well we want some of our people on the board so we know what's happening is actually not a reason to have councillors on the board there might be quite legitimate other reasons to have councillors on the board yeah, well thanks very much thanks Gideon. okay uh, mr simpson <coughs> But following on from that, um, if, if you don't have councillors on board, the council still needs to be able to scrutinise the alio uh, and direct the alio in, in you know in some way. So how how do we how do we achieve that? How do we achieve a a proper level of scrutiny? Well, again, it goes back to being clear about the objectives, how those objectives are going to be monitored, um, how the performance is going to be measured and what the consequences on the alio are of performance or, or lack of performance. And that all has to be set up in, 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 in a proper arrangement. Um, when the alio is, is set up, it then needs to be monitored. And we've, we've uh, quoted, I think, in, in the report, I examples where um, uh, monitoring ha has has improved w with council officers um, looking at alios on, on risk bases on on amount of funding bases and and you need a structure in the council depending how many alios you have to to monitor performance I mean it's crucial that that you ensure that the alios are doing what you set them up to do but you, 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 you need, just need to do it a, a different way if, if you don't have someone on the board. But, but I come back to the point that having someone on the board um, can do a number of things, but one of the things it, it can't do is, is, is sort of represent you on the board and report back to you of what's happening because those are the things that are constrained. So you need to do that um, through uh, proper sort of legally valid channels. Yeah. I think the only other thing I would add uh, to that is that there, there is a fine line, I think, Mr Simpson, between you mentioned scrutiny and, and direction. And certainly in the case of charitable alios, I think Oscar, the Office for the Scottish Charities Regulator, gets, would be concerned at a council directing mm -hmm. a charity board to do stuff. So, so this is another example of where the, the demarcation is really quite important um, because it's absolutely legitimate and important in terms of following the public pound for councils to scrutinise, you know, best value performance and those things. But there is also still the point of them being arm's length is, is that the councils, generally speaking, wouldn't be directing them to do stuff. So let, let, Which is why the setting up, yeah. as the chair said right at the outset, is hugely important. The purpose of that is hugely important. And we mentioned uh, a couple of examples in the borders, how they've uh, established what they call a strategic governance group. So they don't have councillors on the board, but they do have a board of councillors whose job specifically it is to scrutinise and monitor the performance of, of the care alio on the border. So, okay. so there are ways of managing it. We could, you could, for example, have a, a, a leisure trust um, who take a, a purely commercial decision to allow certain, certain sports to use leisure centres over other sports because those sports earn them more money a commercial decision but that might might not necessarily be the best decision for the health of the the council area um, and the council as a whole may take a different view so how how can a council influence the alio in that in that situation well it would be down to the the it would be down to the agreement between the council and the alio in the first place as to exactly what services the alio had to provide and how those services were defined and monitored. Um, I, I, I would also just comment in passing that you, 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 you could have a, a leisure centre that's run directly by the council that has also got a dilemma of do we... Um, provide services that might be better for the community as a whole, or do we actually make more money so we can keep keep yeah. going? So yeah, it, it yeah. wouldn't. It's not just an alio that might have that that sort of decision to make. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, Alexander Stewart. Thank you. The report itemises that in some areas, 25 out of our 32 councils are actively involved in alios, especially in the culture and leisure side. Yeah. Uh, and you've and you've itemised why that might be the case. And there was some of the. The influence came from taxation 
uh, initially for some of them. But now that we have potential taxation reform, what impact and where do you see that taking them? Um, well, I, I, the, the, the Barclay Review, um, folks, as, as, uh, as uh, Mr. Whiteman referred earlier to, to the damaging effect on competition and, and, in effect, the market mechanism of, of uh, a tax subsidy, if you like. And the government's gone, gone some way towards that um, in, in the provisions it's bringing forward. As I understand it, new alios won't benefit from any tax break. Now, you, you'd see that about half the alios were charitable alios, so it would only affect charitable alios. And then the question would be whether that um, marginal tax benefit was the critical issue in making the decision or not. Now, in some cases, it will be, and, in, uh, and we know certainly already of a case where it has been, and, and the Council's looking at another way. So it will definitely affect the number of new alios to some extent. In terms of existing alios, I, I think the position is unclear. I'm, I don't know to what extent uh, existing alios can uh, uh, expand their their activities without um, a penalty. Um, I mean, clearly, in the ordinary course of business, you would expect them to expand their activities. So I, I don't know how. I think it's unclear generally how that 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 works. So I, I wouldn't be able to give a view on on what I thought about the uh, impact on existing alios. And, and going forward, what kind of sort of risk assessments and governance and scrutiny should alios consider when the 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 environment seems to be changing? Well, um, we recommend anyway that given, and, and the previous paper we made the point that, that tomorrow is, is different from yesterday these days. Um, so councils do need regularly to, to have a look at, you know, we've got this alio, why do we have this alio? Does that still make sense? Yep. I, I think the tax change is an environmental change that, that would, would result in, in such a review, yes for charitable alleys. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, I'm happy to ask more questions than other members at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Whiteman. Um, just on that, there's quite a few changes taking place in alleys that have been set up. Some are coming back in in house. Um, to, to what extent is um, because as part of budget scrutiny, we're we're looking this year at workforce uh, planning, and you highlight that in the previous discussion. Uh, as one of the big uh, uh, challenges. To what extent um, do ALIOs provide uh, a useful mechanism to plan workforces because arguably they're more flexible? On the other hand, um, it can be very difficult to plan a workforce when it's not your workforce. I'm talking about the council planning the delivery of services. So on, on balance, um, are ALIOs a, a, a good thing, a bad thing, or an indifferent thing when it comes to uh, planning workforces for the future? Yes, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to give you the, the sort of an answer in the same theme as, as before, that uh, alios are va varied and it, it, it's rather situation specific as to whether they would be a good thing or, or, or a bad thing. It, it'll depend, I mean, on their size, on, on the, the sort of work they're doing. I mean, clearly an alio will be more flexible on, on its terms. That could be a good thing. It might be able to attract people that, that the council couldn't. Um, on the other hand, um, in, in terms of, of total uh, employment and, and the council planning, um, clearly there is, there is a barrier there. Um, it's, it's not necessarily as easy to, to get a handle on, on the future uh, employment of, of Alios if you're looking at the whole thing. So in, if it's a major issue um, in terms of a, a high employment activity that that could um, be something that, that the council has to work around to to overall plan its workforce so i think it sort of swings and roundabouts a bit I mean, fraser do you want to i think the answer is it depends <laughs> yeah, sure. I'm, I'm afraid that and yeah. um, i know that's not terribly helpful but but it kind of does i mean i think what this brings us back to is our core point in this is is the absolute central importance of purpose and being clear about why you're setting a thing up um, and actually being clear about what it is you want to achieve will then help you decide um, through a kind of good and effective options appraisal process what the best vehicle for that delivery is. Um, I think in a funny kind of way, 
the decisions around Barclay means that, in, if anything, councils will need to think harder about that because I think in the past it's been too easy to say we get a tax break, let's do that. And if we're honest, in lots of places we haven't seen um, terribly much by way of different ways of delivering services. It's just that you know the leisure the leisure services have continued to to function as was, but but they don't, but they get tech, but they get tax relief. Um, if anything, I think this now in, and what we're encouraging councils to do is to think more creatively about what they're trying to achieve, what's the best way of delivering it, and then you get to a decision about whether some kind of value might be the best option for that or not. And at that point, issues of workforce would be absolutely critical to the decision that they're taking. And, and have you found any evidence of um, better or more effective engagement with social enterprises, for example, in delivering services with alleys? Maybe ask the team to come in there. Yeah. Um, not specifically with, with social enterprises, nothing that we've, we've come across uh, springs to mind. Um, no. Because no. typically, you know, social enterprises are involved in terms of c contracting and delivering services on a contractual basis. Mm. Um, but Alois hasn't made much difference to that. that not that, that you seen, can. Not that we've seen. No. Okay. Workforce, but and apologies for going back to the previous report. But in the previous report, um, we looked at the last evidence session at 41. It says our analysis by council over the period 2011 to 2017 suggests that some councils have relied more heavily than others on staff reductions to making savings. Uh, however, because we are unable to track staff moving to arm's length external organisations, it's difficult to draw clear conclusions about changing workforce numbers nationally. Why don't we just know how many workers there are in Alios? Surely to goodness this is just audited, there's an outturn and we can look at it, we can analyse and we can scrutinise it because we can try to get our heads around the efficacy of Alios and the benefit of Alios but we're also looking at workforce planning in the round. So sort of to backtrack slightly but when I look at local government workforce planning going forward I want to see those employed by the local authority those employed by local authority alios and those contracted by the local authority including third sector and private organizations in in care for example so in relation to alios do 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 we have a best guess on how many staff there are employed i mean it's i think that's a fair point in terms of the, the total workforce Yes, um, we're not in the business of guessing, you know, I'm sure you know that. But what I will say is that we are drawing our workforce information from returns that are made. And at the moment, those, those areas that you mentioned that would be interesting are not included in those returns. So it's simply a matter that our sources, it's not to say that there wouldn't be a way of uncovering n numbers around alleys within particular local authority areas, but they're not routinely gathered as part of the returns that are made on workforce. So whose job would it be to decide what is routinely gathered? The, well, presumably the people who are asking for some of those returns, which include the Scottish Government for workforce returns for local government. So the Scottish Government could specify in more granular detail the workforce employed directly by local authorities, the workforce employed through ALIOs and workforce contracted elsewhere. So, so they could do that. Um, I think the, my guess is, and this is a better question for government convener, but my guess is that some of the definitional issues around that would be really quite complex because I'm not sure where you would draw the line. Councils contract and and have re and have you know service relationships with a huge number of organisations and public private. Apologies, what if we stick to alios? Apologies, I tried to widen the alios. The alios, but, alios then. but the alios, but we again, you, you kind of come back to the definitional issues because you know, for example, do you include Lothian buses? For example, do you include the people that work for the SECC, which is a wholly owned company of Glasgow City Council? Where do you draw the line? So so the figures that we referred to earlier, which, which we get from the staffing watch, is specifically about those employed by councils. What I would say is that there's a slight separation for me about us understanding the size of the local government workforce, as you've just, as you've just described it, um, and that being quite tricky. What absolutely should be happening, to come back to the earlier conversation, is that Councils um, on a service delivery basis should be including alios and other and other organisations when they are trying to figure out the future for that service and the workforce they have at their disposal. So we would expect individual councils to have to have that level of that level of detailed information. And is there best practice guidelines for local authorities and how they do their workforce planning then in relation to that? And who would scrutinise that? Maybe this committee. I don't know, but who who would scrutinise that? 
Um, so, in, I mean, in terms of general workforce planning, we look at that through the best value work, um, and there's statutory guidance and other things about the, how you manage your people. Uh, the care inspectorate and others would have a strong view about how social care workforces are planned for, education, Scotland, likewise. So, so I guess from our perspective, we're interested in the overall approach to workforce planning, and then individual inspectorates will be interested in individual service areas. Okay, uh, another. Uh, um, please, other members come in and ask a question, but I'm going to ask this this one. So again, sorry to be to be Glasgow centric again, but I'm a, I'm a Glasgow MSP. One of the things the new administration has said it's going to do is bring Cordia back, back in to direct local authority control. Um, there's a gradual process in, in, in relation to, to, to doing that. Um, there's a cash cost to doing that, some of it administrative, bureaucratic, but some of it because the terms and conditions that Cordia staff, quite often low-paid female workers were on with Cordia, the equivalents who are directly employed by the local authority would be on a better salary and better conditions. So the, there's a cost to bring in um, a predominantly female low-paid workforce directly to the council. So, so <coughs> excuse me, has the council commission looked at whether one of the reasons for having alios might be to pay workers less on poorer conditions? I think we cover um, this area in, in the report. And um, I think in the case of Cordia, we, we quote there was a a, a legal case that, that um, uh, Cordia staff could compare themselves with um, with council staff, um, although that wouldn't cover absolutely everything, including pe pension arrangements and such. Um, and it is up to the council to, to ensure that there are uh, appropriate um, employment policies applied by ALEOS, and we didn't find that there was um, any systematic issue there where you know alleys were employing people at, at much less i think that's that's fair yeah yeah i think across the piece the evidence would suggest um that councils are actually trying to maintain terms and conditions for staff when they transfer over to alleys I, I say that's that's that in the majority of cases that we looked at that was that was mm. the situation and i fully accept it's a complex debate cause it depends what grading system you lose what you use what equivalencies you, you apply uh, to the local authority from Alloys. I, I know it's not that straightforward, but I did note when the announcement was made there was a there was a cost to that. Some of that cost was going into staff wages, which which I welcome that, that staff wages were, were, were uplifted. Now I've got one final question if no one else has a question. So I'll, I'll leave it as an open question. We are we're doing budget scrutiny. Uh, new process for budget scrutiny in relation to, to this committee and the Parliament as a whole. We're trying to get a better understanding of not just the inputs, so how much money the, 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 you know, the council gets from the Scottish Government or from fees and charges from council tax, but actually delivering better outcomes for for the constituents that we all serve. We're grappling with that. Alios are a significant employer, even though we don't know how many people are actually employed by Alios. Um, whilst they're not directly employed by Glasgow City Council, in my case, or other local authorities, effectively a lot of Alios are subsidised by their local authorities, so therefore, in reality, uh, council tax money and government money is being used to subsidise alios. We've got our budget scrutiny ahead of us. How would you suggest to us that we follow the public pound to make sure alios are properly resourced and doing the jobs we'd all like them to do? Definitions to one side, Mr McKinley, so I'm not talking about the SECC, for example, but maybe care services, leisure services. Back in the olden days, we would just say core council services. Well, I, I think, again, looking at the report, the evidence we've seen is that Alios are providing good quality of services in a number of areas, and indeed uh, the, 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 their financial return for the council it has been good in a number of cases. I think we quote some examples where, I mean, you, you said the council's subsidising the Alio, but in fact the funding that the council's providing to the Alio to provide a service that the council would otherwise wish to provide has in fact reduced o over over time. So in fact, the council is getting a benefit from the fact that the ALEO is able to, to generate other income. Um, so I, I, I think looking at it in terms of subsidy is probably not the way I, I would look at it. I'd look at it in terms of um, what services um, is the council looking 
for the ALEO to provide and what amount of funding is being devoted to those services and what's the quality of those services. I mean, that's the way around I'd probably approach it. I mean, Fraser, have you got? I think only to say that we are, we are really committed, convener, to supporting all committees in the new budget process. So uh, it may be that we can pick up the conversation with the clerks and see if there's anything that we can help provide that would help you get a bit of clarity around that. Um, more than happy to take that conversation forward as we are with other committees as you go through this new this new approach to scrutinising the budget. I think that would be very helpful, and in particular Mr Sharp's response in relation to subsidy. I almost bought into a whole other narrative there when I use subsidy. I get the idea that councils uh, use their funds to deliver services, and ALUs are part of that service delivery mechanism, and if you could do that more efficiently, fantastic but that doesn't make it a subsidy it just means the money councils are spending to provide these these various services so that gives me a bit of clarity in relation to taking forward some budget scrutiny going forward can i thank all of our witnesses this morning over uh, two evidence sessions it's been very helpful for us and we look forward to developing that relationship further to aid us in our budget scrutiny uh, so thank you for attending and we'll now move to agenda item three consideration of evidence which we've already previously agreed to take in private thank you gentlemen <laughs>